If you've ever worked on a real world product, be it a smartphone, car, or commercial jet, you've probably experienced this. You spend weeks modeling a part in CAD and perfecting the design, ensuring correct geometry, a clean feature tree, and precise constraints. Everything looks production ready and you feel confident it will translate seamlessly to manufacturing. You finally send out the design for production and a few days later, you receive an email that makes your heart sink. It says, we can't manage manufacture this as designed. What's even worse, sometimes the supplier does manufacture the part, but when it arrives, incoming quality inspection flags multiple dimensions as out of tolerance. Nope. The supplier did not mention any issues during production. They simply shipped it anyway. Suddenly your project is delayed, quality assurance is breathing down your neck, and production cannot proceed. These situations are way more common than many mechanical engineers realize. They're not simply caused by bad engineers or bad suppliers, but instead by a disconnect between design and manufacturing. Designing parts that align with the manufacturer's capabilities while balancing specifications, tolerances, assembly constraints, and building strong supplier relationships is a skill that universities don't teach. So in this video, I will share what I like to call my D to M framework, short for design to manufacture, which is a nine stage process that will ensure every part that you design is made to specification on time and within budget every single time. This framework will help you master the design for manufacturer mindset and help you integrate it from the very beginning of your design process. The first stage in this framework is to define the design intent and context of the part. Every part begins with understanding its true purpose, not just its geometry. You must define the functional requirements, the environmental conditions it will encounter, how it will interact with other components, and what life cycle and maintenance expectations exist. For example, if you're designing a motor housing, you need to specify whether it will be used indoors or outdoors, the expected motor vibration levels, heat dissipation, and load requirements, and whether it requires a specific IP rating for dust or water protection. Documenting this clearly provides both your team and manufacturers manufacturers with insights into the reasoning behind every design choice. On one of my projects, a component was designed for a dusty industrial environment, but the drawings did not specify ceiling requirements. When the first batch of parts arrived, vent holes allowed dust to enter, forcing a costly redesign and a production delay. By defining design intent at the outset, you can prevent these kinds of mistakes and set the stage for successful manufacturing. The second stage involves understanding the production volume, product life cycle, and cost targets. Production volume and life cycle have a direct impact on every design decision you make. If you're producing 10 prototypes, it's reasonable to use CNC machining with tight tolerances. But if you're making 50,000 units a year, every extra chamfer, hole, or cosmetic surface adds up in machining time and cost. Unless, of course, you're Apple, where high precision machining is part of their brand identity, and justified by scale and pricing. You need to define the expected annual production volume, the expected lifespan of the part, the cost target per unit, and the likely frequency of design revisions. I've seen teams design these beautifully machined aluminum brackets that made perfect sense for prototyping, but once the design scaled to production volumes, the cost per part exceeded targets by a significant margin. By considering volume and cost targets, you can select the most appropriate process, material, and supplier, preventing expensive downstream surprises. The third stage is to match the design with the appropriate manufacturing process. Not every process is suitable for every part, and selecting the wrong one early can lead to costly redesigns later. Your choice depends on several factors, not just annual production volume. You have to consider material type, geometry, tolerances, surface finish, strength requirements, lead time, and budget. For instance, injection molding works well for high volume plastic parts, but it can't be used for metals. In contrast, die casting is ideal for non-ferrous metals like aluminum or zinc, while forging is suitable for structural steel components that require high strength and fatigue resistance. C 
CNC machining is best for low to mid volume parts that require tight tolerances or complex geometries, especially during prototyping. Sheet metal fabrication is efficient for enclosures, brackets, or chassis components due to its speed and low tooling costs. Casting or forging, on the other hand, excels in large production runs where strength and cost efficiency matter most. Selecting the right process early prevents redesigns, reduces waste, and ensures that the product can be made efficiently at the required quantity and quality levels. The fourth stage focuses on vetting and understanding supplier capabilities. Many engineers fail at this stage because they or their organization's supply chain manager goes with the supplier without fully understanding what they can actually do. Every supplier has unique machine limits, tooling setups, and areas of expertise. Before finalizing your design, you must determine the maximum and minimum part sizes they can handle, the tolerances they can reliably maintain, and which materials and finishes are produced in-house versus outsourced, typical lead times, and whether they provide design for manufacturer feedback before production. Whenever possible, request sample parts, capability decks, and examples of past projects. I'm just gonna say that visiting the supplier in person is extremely valuable if possible. You can often learn more in an hour on site than through weeks of email communication. But when working with suppliers overseas, for instance, in China or India, communication and time zone differences add an additional layer of complexity. A small misunderstanding and a tolerance callout or surface finish specification can easily turn into thousands of non-conforming parts. That's why you should always document everything clearly, use standardized technical drawings in ASME or ISO formats, and confirm critical details through annotated screenshots or marked up PDFs than just step files over the phone and video rather than email if possible. Language barriers can also affect how feedback is interpreted. Even if a supplier says okay to your request, it often means they acknowledge it, but they may not fully understand your intent. Building a relationship where both sides feel comfortable asking clarifying questions is essential. For example, during a project involving custom parts, a supplier in China quoted us a short lead time for CNC machining. However, once production started, delays occurred because their anodizing process was outsourced to another facility. The extra logistics extended the timeline by nearly two weeks. This was partially our fault because had we verified which operations were done in-house versus outsourced earlier, we could have planned the schedule more accurately. So understand not just what your supplier can do, but how they communicate and operate to ensure that your designs can be produced as intended without any surprises once production begins. The fifth stage is to involve suppliers early in the design process. Do not wait until your design is finalized to share it with your manufacturer. Suppliers should be fully engaged during the design for manufacturer and design for assembly stages. Sharing a near final CAD model in advance with ample time before a design freeze allows manufacturers to raise concerns and flag any unnecessary features, undercuts, thin walls, or missing draft angles. So during the design of this plastic enclosure, for example, a supplier noticed that several surfaces lacked adequate draft and recommended making the tooling steel safe. This means leaving a small amount of extra material in those regions so adjustments could be made later without rebuilding the mold. This preventative step saved rework costs and ensured that the parts were molded correctly on the first try. Throughout product development, it's vital to touch base with your supplier at every key stage or revision, make sure they have the latest drawings, and double check alignment on specifications to avoid any miscommunication and unnecessary delays. The sixth stage is to optimize and apply design for manufacturing and assembly principles. Once supplier input has been integrated, this is where you refine the geometry, features, and interfaces to make the design as practical, economical, and efficient as possible to produce. For example, this 
forged steel control arm design once had sharp internal transitions and varying cross sections that disrupted metal flow during forging. The supplier reported high scrap rates and premature die wear. By rounding transitions, maintaining uniform walk thickness, and aligning the parting line with the direction of material flow, the updated design produced cleaner forgings with fewer defects and reduced tooling maintenance. That single design revision lowered the reject rate by over 20% and extended die life by thousands of cycles. At this stage, your design should not only meet performance and cosmetic requirements, but flow naturally through every stage of manufacturing and assembly from raw material to final product. The seventh stage is to finalize and clearly define tolerances, finishes, and materials. Many quality issues arise from vague or inconsistent specifications. Suppliers interpret drawings literally and will apply internal standards if your requirements are not explicit. You must specify critical dimensions and tolerances for holes, fits, and interfaces, define surface finishes where necessary, and provide exact material grades. An example of the consequences of unclear specifications is applying a plus minus 100 millimeter tolerance on non-critical surfaces, which increase machining time by over 300%. By loosening non-critical tolerances and maintaining tight tolerances on essential features, you can reduce cycle time and costs without compromising performance. Clear specifications reduce error, scrap, and lead time, ensuring parts are delivered as intended. Now, before we continue, one of my favorite platforms that was instrumental in helping me develop essential mechanical engineering skills was Brilliant, the sponsor of today's video. Brilliant helps you become a better thinker and problem solver with thousands of visual interactive lessons in math, science, programming, data analysis, and AI. Brilliant's lessons build problem solving skills by allowing you to play with concepts. This method is proven to be six times more effective than watching lecture videos. Brilliant's lessons are crafted by professors, researchers, and professionals from MIT, Caltech, Microsoft, and Google, so you learn from the best. Brilliant promotes critical thinking through active learning, not memorization, so you become a better thinker. It also helps develop the habit of daily learning essential for both personal and professional growth. You can level up at home or on the go with Brilliant's interactive bite-sized lessons. One of my favorites is Brilliant's calculus course that teaches you how to solve real-world engineering problems with derivatives, integrals, and more. To learn for free on Brilliant, go to brilliant.org slash engineering gone wild, scan the QR code on screen, or you can click on the link in the description below. Brilliant's also given our viewers 20% off an annual premium subscription, which gives you unlimited daily access to everything on Brilliant. The eighth stage involves prototyping, sampling, and validation. This is essentially your checkpoint before committing to full production. Prototypes validate the design, while samples or first article inspection parts validate the manufacturing process. During this stage, you should check dimensional accuracy, surface finish consistency, fit with mating parts, and assembly ergonomics. Always review your supplier's inspection reports alongside your own quality control data, though this is usually QA's job. If parts are borderline but pass inspection, note the potential for variation during full production. Whenever possible, request production part approval process documentation before scaling up. This helps lock down a stable process window and tells you that your supplier's process is stable, repeatable, and ready for manufacturing ramp. The ninth and final stage is to ensure traceability and continuous improvement. Even after production begins, the work is not complete. You should maintain traceable data for every batch of parts, including material certificates, process parameters, and inspection reports. This ensures that if a part fails in the field, the root cause can be identified quickly. In addition, regular reviews with suppliers, either quarterly or per production run, are essential. During these reviews, discuss what went well, what did not, how yield, cycle time, or quality can be improved. Continuous improvement strengthens supplier relationships and ensures that future designs benefit from accumulated knowledge. So whether your parts are made in-house or through external suppliers, the design to manufacturer framework applies just the same. The principles of early collaboration, process validation, and continuous improvement transcend organizational 
internal boundaries. It doesn't matter if you're handing your design to an internal machine shop or a global contract manufacturer. The goal of ensuring that every part is manufacturable, delivered on time, made to specification, and cost effective every single time remains the same. All right, guys, that's it for today. As always, thank you so much for watching. If you found this video helpful, be sure to check out my video here where I share why you may not fully understand mechanical engineering and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.